second half here. Our speaker will be Liz Jackson from Ryerson University, who's an assistant professor over there. Her research interests include the intersection of formal and traditional philosophy, uh, philosophy, uh, epistemology in particular, the relationship of belief and credence, the nature of belief, um, a fair bit on faith and Pascal's wager, which with which our paper today will be concerned. And we'll hear comments from Anne Jeffrey, who I'm told is ecstatic um, about what happened with men's basketball, uh, college basketball. But aside from that is an assistant professor at Baylor who works on virtue ethics, moral and rational development, and also has her hands in political philosophy, philosophy, religion, and bioethics. So take her away, thank you. Awesome, thank you so much. So I did put a link to a handout in the chat. I don't think anyone has joined since I posted that. So hopefully everyone can see that. Or wait, oh, just kidding. I only sent it directly to Adam, hold on. <laughs> let me let me redo that. Okay. I always get confused about who I'm messaging when and end up doing the wrong people. So hopefully everyone can see that now, I'm sorry. <laughs> Good, okay, sweet. So. Um, just wanted to say thanks to everyone for being here um, at the virtual SCP session. Really appreciate everyone coming. And then also thanks to Adam and Becca and Jose for uh, organizing this session and all just, I know it took, took a good amount of effort and organization. So we really appreciate that. And then um, also to Charity and Laura for an awesome first session. That was really great. And I learned a lot. So thanks to both of you. And then finally, thanks to Anne. Um, Anne read my paper and gave me like extensive detailed comments on it um, beyond what she's just gonna talk about today. So thank you so much, Anne. I really appreciate that. Um, and I'm definitely looking forward to, yeah, our back and forth. And then the last thing I was gonna say is this paper is actually eventually gonna be forthcoming in the Monist, which um, it's a special issue on faith, hope and trust, but it's not until 2023. <laughs> so I have plenty of time to kind of incorporate feedback. So. Um, yeah, I definitely still working on it, making changes. It's actually kind of in its first draft form. So probably we'll have some, some major changes, including adding some stuff on virtue based on uh, some of Anne's comments. Okay, so let's go ahead and jump in to the paper. So um, what I wanna start off with is just a basic uh, kind of philosophy 101 summary of Pascal's wager. So Pascal's wager is an argument that you should believe in God, essentially because um, there is lots to gain if you believe in God and God exists, and potentially lo lots to lose if God exists and you don't believe in God. And so um, I have the basic sort of decision matrix on your handout for kind of the most uh, basic version of Pascal's wager, but the thought is this, look, if if God exists, the value of believing in God is infinitely positive, sort of given the possibility of going to heaven, having a relationship with God, having union with God, those sorts of considerations. Um, and if God exists and you don't believe in God, the value of not believing is infinitely negative, given the possibility of going to hell or being separated from God. Um, and then if God doesn't exist, the gains and losses associated with believing or not believing are um, finite and thus negligible. So we can argue about which situation would be better, but um, ultimately the infinite considerations are gonna outweigh those. So this is a very rudimentary, very basic version of Pascal's wager and there's many objections to it. And so I'm not gonna um, address a lot of kind of the common objections, but if you want, I, I am happy to talk about those in Q and A. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say, I think I have a satisfying response to every possible objection, but I do think that um, a lot of the objections to Pascal's wager do fail. I just think we probably have to make the argument a little more nuanced than this one. Um, and I think I'll, I'll note too, like this really, really basic argument. I don't know if anyone actually defends an argument this simple. I think most people think you need some kind of nuances or distinctions made, um, but this is enough to work with, I think for our purposes today. Okay, so what I wanna focus on today is actually a specific objection to Pascal's wager. And that's that has to do with the motives involved in taking Pascal's wager. And so the thought is that taking the wager demonstrates bad motives and specifically motives that God wouldn't be pleased with. Um, and so you might cash this out and say, well, those who take Pascal's wager, they're simply motivated by like a fear of hell or kind of like this selfish desire just to get these rewards of heaven. Um, and then you might further say, well, then if you have these kinds of motives, this can't underlie like a genuine commitment to God or a genuine relationship with God. 
And further, God wouldn't be pleased with these motives. And so it's in a way self-undermining because if you take the wager for these reasons, then it seems like the outcomes won't actually reflect um, what's, what's, on, what's on our handout, this decision table on our handout. Um, and so the main thing I wanna do in this paper is kind of offer a response to this objection. And I want to sort of respond to it in two ways. I first wanna argue that taking Pascal's wager doesn't have to um, demonstrate these poor motives. And then I also, I, I kind of want to cash this out by basically arguing that I think there's a way of taking Pascal's wager that demonstrates um, either genuine faith or genuine hope that God exists. So a basic outline of the talk today, I'm going to first kind of clarify what exactly it means to take Pascal's wager and the kind of wager that I'm focusing on or interested in. Um, and then I'm going to sort of pivot a little bit and talk about faith, like the nature of faith. What is it to have faith? Um, and then I'm going to bring those two things together and show that the person who takes Pascal's wager sort of in the way that I'm interested in and the person of faith actually have quite a bit in common. And then I'll consider a few upshots of this. And then I'll consider a potential objection, um, a case where it seems like someone is taking the wager but isn't demonstrating faith. And then what I'll argue is that in that case, the wagerer nonetheless plausibly hopes that God exists. And then I'll talk about some upshots of that as well. Okay, um, so now we're on section two, faithfully taking Pascal's wager. So the first thing I wanna say here is that it is definitely possible to take Pascal's wager with poor motives. So my goal in this paper is not to argue that everyone that takes the wager automatically has good motives or you know every person that considers something like Pascalian reasoning is that's going to be you know pleasing to God I'm not trying to argue that um, I think that's probably difficult if not impossible to argue um, but what I want to do is I want to carve out a particular way of taking Pascal's wager virtuously and kind of explore and explain how I think that taking the wager can actually underlie a genuine and rational theistic commitment. Um, so again, the goal isn't to argue everyone who takes Pascal's wager does so virtuously, but that I think it's possible to be motivated by something like Pascalian reasoning, um, but have virtuous uh, motives. Okay, so I'm gonna say a little bit more about what exactly I mean by taking Pascal's wager and what kind of mindset and attitude I have in mind. So taking Pascal's wager is roughly making a commitment to God. And this commitment is largely motivated by non-epistemic reasons. Okay, so I'm gonna say a little bit more about that. So what do I mean by making a commitment to God? I wanna read this pretty broadly. So I want to read this. This is including what you might call like a doxastic wager, which is like a belief oriented wager that involves either choosing to believe that God exists in some kind of sort of direct way or taking steps to induce belief in God. Um, but the thing about doxastic wagers is that the main goal or focus is belief. And then there's also what I call the acceptance wager, which is an action oriented wager that involves accepting or acting as if God exists. So you sort of treat the proposition that God exists as true and you center your decision making like a lot of it around the truth of that proposition. So you might you know, go to church and, and pray and put yourself in a religious community, um, take certain, certain actions um, that would make sense to take if God did exist. But it's not necessarily focused on belief, it's more focused on like an action-oriented commitment. Um, so I want to kind of include both of those as at least possible ways one might take the wager. I would say the belief one is probably more controversial, but depending on things we say about faith later, um, that'll affect which one of these uh, two types of wagers we want to go in for. And I'm actually probably more sanguine about the doxastic wager than most people um, for some reasons I'll talk about today, but some reasons I won't have time to get into today. So you can also ask me more about that in Q&A. Okay, so that's making a commitment to God. And then non-epistemic reasons here, um, I take to include both practical and moral reasons. Um, so you might think moral reasons, that's sort of weird, but um, Mike Rhoda has a paper and a book on Pascal's wager and kind of gives some interesting cases where you might actually wager for, uh, for example, the well-being of your friends and family, or you might wager because of considerations about what God would desire or require of you if God existed. 
And so I think I at least don't want to exclude the possibility of wagering for moral reasons, um, although it is traditionally ca cashed out in terms of pragmatic reasons, but um, I want to consider both of those um, today. And then I say largely motivated because um, I think an important lesson from some of the more classic objections to Pascal's wager, like the many gods objection and the mixed strategies objection, is that probability needs to matter, even if we're dealing with infinities. Um, and more specifically, um, even if you have two possible like infinite goods you can get, that doesn't mean that the probability of getting either of those is just irrelevant to your decision. But like all else equal, you should go for like the higher chance of getting an infinite good rather than the lower chance. Um, and I actually think this basic insight, uh, it seems pretty basic, but it actually helps with a lot of the common objections to Pascal's wager because things get weird when we involve infinities. And then I think people make certain assumptions about infinities, but I think those assumptions actually end up being pretty clearly false. So um, the overall lesson is that probability is a factor that matters when we're deciding um, whether we should wager and what we should wager on. Um, it's not the only factor, but I don't want to say like, it's all about infinities trumping finites and we just ignore probabilities. That's not the version of the wager that I'm interested in. Okay. Um, so, and then the last thing I wanted to say was um, something about like the wagerer's motivations. And the wager that I'm focusing on, I'm interested in here is motivated primarily by the goodness of the outcome um, of God's existence, given that they commit to God. So that's why I actually shaded that box on your handout. That is sort of um, the outcome the wager is focusing on and motivated by. And you actually don't have to like believe in hell for the wager to go through. You could also be an annihilationist. So that's one important note. But the, the mindset of the wager I'm thinking of is something like this. Um, if God exists and I commit to God, this would be a very good thing. So if there was this like powerful, good being that created the universe, this is someone I would want to pursue. This is someone I would want to have a relationship and someone that would be worth making a commitment to. Um, and so even this possibility that God exists, even if it's not super highly probable or don't believe that God exists, uh, that possibility nonetheless provides me a, a very strong reason to pursue a relationship with God because knowing a being like that would be so incredibly valuable. And so again, I'm open to like this sense of value being like a pragmatic one or a moral one, but the person I'm interested in here maintains that committing to God, if God exists, would lead to this really positive outcome. And this is the primary reason that they wager. And then once they make this commitment, they maintain that God is, God's existence would, would be a good thing because look, they've, they've bet their life on it. So that's kind of the mindset of the uh, wager that I'm, I'm interested in. Okay, so now I want to move on to 2.2. And again, this is gonna seem a little bit <laughs> disjointed, like I'm gonna talk about faith, but then I'm gonna, um, in the next section, bring, bring these two together. So I, I promise it'll all make sense at the end. But I'm gonna move to sort of talking about faith and um, some recent accounts of faith and specifically addressing what's called propositional faith. So faith that some proposition is true. Um, so I guess before I give our sort of first pass definition of faith, um, I want to remind everyone about the difference between these two kinds of mental states. This plays an important role in a lot of definitions of faith. So there's cognitive mental states, and these are mental states that have a mind to world direction of fit. Um, these mental states often represent the world. They're often sensitive to evidence. So I'm thinking of things like beliefs, credences, probability beliefs. So if I believe it's raining, presumably um, I have some evidence that it's raining. I either see that it's raining or I check the weather or something. And then because the world is that way, my mind conforms to the world. So that's what I mean when I say they have a mind to world direction of fit. Um, then there's conative states are conative states. I actually don't know if it's conative or conative. So if anyone can enlighten me on that, that would be very helpful. Um, but conative states have a world to mind direction of fit. Um, so these would be things like desires or pro attitudes. Um, you could also put beliefs about the good in there. Although Anne pointed out, there's some guys of the good worries that arise. So I don't wanna be too committed to um, including beliefs about the good, but um, but the thought is that these cognitive states, instead of having a mind to world direction of fit, they have a world to mind direction of fit. So if I desire chocolate ice cream, 
Um, I make the world conform to that desire by going and getting chocolate ice cream. Um, and so these cognitive and conative states kind of have different directions of fit. And I think on most views, the conative states are inherently motivational and the cognitive states, I guess, may not be. Okay, so that's kind of a, a distinction between two kinds of mental states that I think play a really important role in understanding faith. And so here's using this distinction, um, a first pass definition of what it means to have faith. So the thought is this, S has faith that a proposition is true, if and only if um, three conditions are met. The first is that um, she has a positive co cognitive attitude towards that proposition. So she thinks if this proposition were true, it would be a good thing, or she desires that proposition to be true. She has a pro attitude towards that proposition, po some kind of positive cognitive attitude. She also has a positive cognitive attitude towards that proposition. So she thinks that proposition is likely to be true. She maybe has a high credence in that proposition. She believes that proposition. She thinks that's the most likely of the live options. There's kind of different candidate possible states here as well. And then the third condition is that she's resilient to counter evidence against that proposition. And I think this is, this is something Laura Bouchek actually talks about quite a bit, but that seems like something really important to faith is that faith is resilient in light of counter evidence. I'm gonna talk more about that um, as we go, but um, kind of meeting those three conditions, I think is at least a plausible sort of first pass definition of faith. Um, and I think this definition is quite popular in the faith literature and, and for good reason. I think it can explain a lot of cases of faith. So um, let's say I have faith, uh, to use a basketball example, like I have faith that you're gonna win your upcoming basketball game. Um, and if I have faith that you're going to win your upcoming basketball game, then it's natural to think I would want you to win. I would have a pro attitude towards your winning. Um, it doesn't really make sense to say that I have faith you're going to win if I either want you to lose or I could care less either way. No, it seems like I need to have that, that desire. Um, and then further, I need to at least take it to be sufficiently likely that you'll win. If I think it's totally impossible that you'll win, like there's no way it's going to happen, um, I probably can't and at least definitely shouldn't have faith that you'll win. And then finally, to some extent, it seems like I will continue to have that faith even in light of counter evidence. So if one of your starting players gets injured, I continue to have faith you'll win, even though there's a little evidence that uh, you'll no longer win because one of your starters is injured. Okay, so that hopefully kind of illustrates that definition, um, maybe motivates it a little bit. And then I wanted to note something about the second condition, which is the cognitive attitude. Um, so there is this debate in the faith literature about the relationship between faith and belief. So some people think faith entails belief. If you have faith that P is true, you must believe P. Um, other people say, no, 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 faith goes beyond the evidence in a way that belief doesn't. So sometimes you could, you're, you know, you could lose evidence so that you can't believe anymore, but you could still continue to have faith. And then people object to that and say, oh, but then you're just pretending or you're just a fictionalist. So there's this debate to be had. I'm not trying to necessarily take a stand on that. Um, but I do want to say, so if you think faith does entail belief, then what condition two will, will say is that the cognitive attitude in question will need to either be belief or include belief. Um, and this also would require, I'll talk more about this later, but the version of the wager that we go in for to be doxastic. So we'll need to have a version of the wager where the way that wager either causes you to believe or causes you to take steps to induce belief. Um, so that's gonna be controversial for sure. But I also didn't, I didn't wanna take a stand on whether faith entailed belief because that's just a very contentious debate. So, <laughs> so you can um, maintain that faith entails belief and still accept my arguments, you'll just have to uh, you'll move the controversial bump in the rug somewhere else. Okay. Um, so another thing I wanted to note about this first pass definition is that I don't think it can capture the idea that faith seems deeply intertwined with our important life commitments. Um, so I think a lot of times, like thinking about a marriage commitment or a commitment to finish grad school or a commitment to, you know, pick up a new instrument, like, seems like faith is really important to these. And I, you know, I don't know, I'm not totally set on whether commitment is necessary for all cases of faith. I think in the paper, I give this like silly example where I'm like, suppose you have faith, this chair will hold you. Do you 
have a commitment to the chair and then you could say well, maybe you have a very thin commitment to the chair you know um so i don't necessarily want to take a stand on whether commitment is always necessary for every instance of propositional faith but i do think that commitment is an important part of theistic faith faith that god exists and that's ultimately why what i'm interested in talking about is what does it mean to have faith that god exists and so um given that I want to suggest, um, I guess, a four part sufficient condition for having faith that God exists. And then I'll say why I only need it to be sufficient in a second. But first, I'll say what it is. So here's the thought. Um, S has faith that God exists if S meets four conditions. Um, positive cognitive attitude, positive cognitive attitude, resilience to counter evidence, and then a commitment to God. And so the thought is, if someone meets all four of these conditions, um, then they have faith that God exists. Um, and then I'll also say, I actually only need that. So like I said, I only need these to be sufficient for faith. I don't necessarily need them to all be necessary conditions. And some people have actually argued there could be cases of faith without the positive conative attitude, for example, like if you have faith that God is a Trinity, but you kind of could care less if God is a Trinity um, is one potential example. You kind of take it on like the testimony of scripture or something, but you're not, you don't have this like super strong desire for God to be a trinity um, might be a potential counterexample to, to the positive cognitive attitude being a necessary condition. So, um, you know, again, we could debate about whether that is necessary or not. I don't necessarily want to take a stand there, but I do want to say these four are jointly sufficient for having faith. And the reason that I need them to be jointly sufficient is because what I want to now argue is that those who take Pascal's wager have faith in virtue of satisfying these four conditions. So in other words, conditions that are satisfied when one takes Pascal's wager are sufficient for having faith that God exists. Um, and I will note too, this also definitely leaves open whether there's other ways to have faith that God exists and also faith in other propositions and faith in general, right? Um, and I think this is really plausible too. Not all who have theistic faith are wagering that God exists there, you know, you might have theistic faith for epistemic reasons, mostly epistemic reasons, for example. So I'm not trying to argue that having faith makes you take Pascal's wager. I'm just trying to argue that on a way of taking Pascal's wager, it's plausible that you have faith. Okay, so let's go to section 2.3, um, where I'm going to kind of put everything we've just talked about together. So the thought here is that those with faith that God exists and those who take Pascal's wager have a lot in common. They have the positive cognitive and cognitive attitudes. They're resilient to counter evidence. And then they make a commitment to God to maybe living a particular kind of life or maybe to believing. Um, so we've already kind of talked about why I think these characterize faith that God exists. Um, but I, I want to say a little bit about why I think they characterize taking Pascal's wager in the way that I've described in 2.1. Um, so plausibly, the wager has a positive cognitive attitude towards God's existence. They're motivated by the goodness of committing to God, given that God exists. And then once they kind of make this commitment to God, they desire God to exist because they've sort of bet their life on it. Um, they also have a positive cognitive attitude towards God's existence because uh, I can't remember if I said this or not, but you shouldn't take Pascal's wager if your credence in theism is zero or um, infinitesimally small. So plausibly, there's some kind of positive cognitive attitude. I'll talk in the next section about what if you have that attitude, but it's like really weak. What do we say about those cases? And that's where we're all bring hope in. Um, but they do have some kind of positive cognitive attitude. And then the way juror is plausibly resistant to counter evidence to God's existence in part because their commitment to God is based on these non-epistemic reasons. So these non-epistemic reasons are at least a big part of what keeps them going. Um, and because of that, they can maintain this commitment to God even in light of counter evidence. Um, and then both the person of faith and the wage juror make a commitment to God. Again, whether this involves some kind of doxastic thing or some kind of more acceptancey thing, um, plausibly both involve a commitment. Um, and so I guess my first sort of preliminary conclusion is that taking Pascal's wager uh, can demonstrate a genuine faith in God. Um, and then two things to note about this. So the first is that if faith does entail belief, then you will have to limit my argument to the doxastic wager, like I sort of mentioned earlier. Um, and so um, again, there's sort of a choice point there. If you want to maintain that faith entails belief, you'll need to go into the doxastic wager. And if you want to 
reject the doxastic wager, then for my argument to work, you'll need to be open to the possibility of faith without belief. Um, and I already said this, so I'll just say it briefly. I'm not claiming that everyone who has faith takes Pascal's wager. So I wanted to reiterate that. Okay, and I think there's two kind of really interesting upshots of this point. So the first is that I think this shows that it's possible to take the wager with virtuous motives, although Anne's gonna talk more about this. So I'm really interested to um, talk more about whether that's actually right, but um, the wager is motivated by the goodness of knowing God, if God exists. And I think because plausibly by wagering, they demonstrate faith that God's, God exists, um, at least this seems like a pretty good motive. Um, faith is also a theological virtue and one of the central marks of a devoted religious life. And so um, I hope what I've done is sort of carved out a way where you can take Pascal's wager in a way that demonstrates virtuous motives that are pleasing to God. So that's the first upshot. The second upshot is that I think if taking Pascal's wager demonstrates faith, this can help with what's called the impossibility objection, which says, look, even if you're right that you should take Pascal's wager, it's impossible to because, you know, we can't control our beliefs in the right way or we can't, we just can't make ourselves that certain that God exists or whatever. Um, but if taking Pascal's wager demonstrates faith and then faith is sort of the central thing that God is interested in or requires, um, those who wager won't have to force themselves into some kind of impossible doxastic state where they're, you know, just certain that God exists or have this really strong belief that God exists or even believe that God exists, maybe if you think you could have faith without belief. Um, but the commitment that results from taking Pascal's wager will actually be sufficient as it constitutes having faith. Um, and, you know, again, if you're really set on like faith entailing belief, then you might have to have an additional story here about why we can control our beliefs, at least more than many philosophers think. Um, I actually think we can control our beliefs a lot more than many philosophers think. So you should feel free to ask me about that in q and I'm uh, kind of working on a paper actually about this and how it relates to Pascal's wager. Um, that's kind of separate, but um, don't have necessarily time to go into that now, but um, happy to talk about that in Q&A. Okay, so now we're on section three and hopefully I'm, I'm almost done. I think I might be a little under 45 minutes. Um, so section three is hopefully taking Pascal's wager. So here's an objection that you might raise to what I have um, just argued. And the thought is that someone with very, very low credences in theism might take Pascal's wager. It's plausible that they would, you know, maybe they have a 0.01 credence in theism, but they say, look, I could gain so much if God existed and I committed to God. And because of that, I'm gonna sort of take a chance on this and bet my life on it, even though I think it's quite unlikely. Um, so if you have this low of a credence, it doesn't seem like, at least it's hard to see how you could have faith that God exists because you think it's so much more likely that atheism is true or, you know, whatever the rest of your, your possibility space is divided in between. Um, so the thought is it doesn't seem that faith that God exists is consistent with credences that are this low. Um, so I have two replies to this. So my first reply is I'm very interested in the possibility that faith that God exists is actually consistent with at least lower credences in theism than we might have initially thought. Um, and I, I think there's, again, this sort of hangs on this question of whether faith entails belief. So one possibility, probably the most controversial, but something I'm, I'm really interested in is this idea that, look, if faith does entail belief, maybe it's actually possible and even potentially rational to believe things that you have middling or even maybe low credences in. Um, I don't have necessarily time to go into a bunch of cases of this now, but there are some cases. So um, Charity talked about a racehorse case. There's another racehorse case where there's like three horses that are um, in this race, horse A, horse B, horse C. I don't remember the exact numbers, but it's something like horse A is like 46% likely to win. And then both horse B and horse C are like 20 something percent likely to win. And so like John Hawthorne and some other people are like, it's reasonable for you to believe that horse A will win since it's sort of the most likely of your live options, even though your credence in that is below 0.5. Um, that's just one case. There's a lot of other cases that I think are interesting to think about as well. But the thought is like there might be cases where irrational belief is actually consistent with credences in the 0.5 range or even slightly lower, sort of depending on maybe the rest of your epistemic situation. 
Um, so I'm interested in exploring that idea more. Don't necessarily want my whole argument to hang on it, but it's um, something I've, I've thought a little bit about. Um, but then the thought is, look, if faith doesn't entail belief, then maybe faith could be consistent with even lower credences than belief. So maybe your credence goes so low that you got to give up your belief, but you can nonetheless continue to have faith that God exists. And then maybe like, maybe at, once you go below 0.5, you should give up your belief, but um, you could continue to have faith maybe until you hit like 0.3. I don't know. I just get, throw random numbers out there, but I think you guys get the idea. Okay. So that's sort of my first preliminary response. But again, I don't even, I don't know if this is gonna help us with like the 0 0.01 credence case. So that brings me to a second response, which is the thought that even if one's credences are too low to count as having faith, even given faiths being consistent with pretty low credences, um, I think plausibly the wagerer demonstrates hope that God exists. Um, so to sort of show this, I want to, consider, I think, what's called like the classic account of hope, or um, I think a lot of people's like first pass account of hope. And that's this, um, S hopes that P, if and only if, S has a positive cognitive attitude towards P, and then S has what I'm calling a weak positive cognitive attitude towards P. Uh, so I'm weak positive cognitive attitude, that's just a technical term. Uh, so don't read into that too much. And all I mean by that is like either a non-zero credence in P or a belief that P is possible. So in some sense, the possibility of P just needs to be live for S to hope that P. Um, here's a quick example. You might have a picnic plan for tomorrow. You check the forecast. You see that there's a 95% chance of rain. You can nonetheless, <laughs> even if you can't have faith that uh, it will be sunny tomorrow because 95 is pretty high. It seems like you could still hope that it will be sunny tomorrow um, because you have that positive cognitive attitude towards P, you want it to be sunny tomorrow, and there's at least some chance it'll be sunny, even if it's a small chance. Um, so that's a quick example. And then one insight that a lot of people have had, and I, I talk about this in a forthcoming paper, but it's definitely not original to me, um, is this idea that when you lose evidence, you can move from faith to hope. Um, so remember, I talked about this basketball case where I have faith that you're going to win your basketball game tomorrow. Um, and then let's say not only does one member of your starting five get injured, but all, all of your starting five gets injured somehow, every single player. Um, if all of them get injured, it seems like I probably should give up my faith that you'll win because all of your best players are not playing. Um, but I can still hope you'll win. I still have the positive cognitive attitude towards you winning. And there's still some chance you win, even if it's unlikely. So, um, so I think when we lose evidence so that we can't have faith anymore, we can move to sort of hope. Um, okay, one thing I wanna note, and maybe I won't talk too much about this cause I'm already going longer than I thought, but I, I, so the standard view of hope has these two conditions. Um, there are some puzzles in the hope literature. So two of them are one is what distinguishes hope from despair. They, they look similar in certain respects, uh, a despairing person and a hopeful person. So how do we distinguish these two mindsets? Um, and then the second puzzle is how does hope have this extraordinary motivating power in difficult circumstances like surviving a really serious illness or even surviving like concentration camp or something. Um, and so because of these two puzzles, people do add a third condition, um, maybe sometimes a fourth, but normally just a third condition to the definition of hope to try to help with these puzzles. So just very briefly, um, Mirov argues that hope involves an attitude towards some kind of external factor. And that is the realization on which the realization of the hope for end causally depends. Um, and then Calhoun argues that hope provides some kind of phenomenological idea of the future. Uh, Martin argues that hope's cognitive attitude provides this justification for a certain set of attitudes and emotions. Um, and then Chignell has this focus theory of hope where hope involves some kind of special attention that's paid to the hoped for outcome. I'm not going to go into the details of all these accounts because I don't think they're super important for our purposes, but the main thought is that 
on all these accounts where they add this third condition to what it means to help, I think the, the person, the, the wager that we're interested in is gonna meet that condition. So for Mirab's external factor, the wager's external factor is God. And in fact, Mirab gives that as an example of, of hope. Um, God could be that, that external factor that the hope depends on. For Calhoun's view, um, uh, hope provides this phenomenological idea of the future. And I think this can be explained by um, the long-term commitment uh, that the wager has to pursuing a relationship with God. For Martin's account of hope, hope provides this justification for certain attitudes and emotions. Um, and look, I, I think hope can justify this long-term commitment to God. I actually have this paper, this forthcoming paper, or I spell this out in a lot of detail. I don't think hope can always justify a commitment to that proposition in question, but I think especially in the case of hoping that God exists, um, very plausibly it can in a lot of cases. And then on Chignell's focus theory, um, hope involves special attention to this hope for outcome. And that's kind of what our shaded box represents, this um, special attention to focusing on the goodness of the possibility that God exists when you commit to God. So I think um, plausibly, I know that was kind of quick, but I think I can uh, make sense of these third conditions that are often added to hope and argue that the wager meets those conditions. So that brings me, I think, to my ultimate and final thesis, and that is if one takes Pascal's wager, then uh, kind of in the way that I described in section two, then one either has faith that God exists or hopes that God exists. And I think um, in this, the wager exemplifies uh, virtuous motives, and um, I don't automatically think that taking Pascal's wager means what you do, you know, isn't pleasing to God or whatever. Um, and then the final thing I wanted to briefly address is sort of given my appeal to hope, can this help with the impossibility objection, the idea that taking Pascal's wager is impossible um, because, you know, you can't force yourself to belief or whatever. Um, and, and I think this is related to the question, like, what is the soteriological status of those that hope that God exists, right? Um, and I think there's four things I just want to note in response. So the first is that going from completely uncommitted to God to committed to God and hoping that God exists, I think raises the probability of, you know, salvation, experiencing the beatific vision, being united to God. Um, it's really hard to know exactly what's required for salvation anyway. This is the subject of a ton of theological debate. A lot of people are universalists. So, you know, I think it at least raises the probability. Um, and then related, a second reply is that I think believing that God exists is very likely not necessary for salvation in all cases. Consider like young children that, did, that die before they have the concepts of, uh, you know, God and, and so they can form beliefs about God. I, I think it would be very wrong to say that, uh, you know, they can't be saved. Um, <clears throat> so that's second reply. Third reply is that, the wager um, may not just be motivated by salvation. Um, I'm very open to the idea that someone might wager for like pre pre mortem benefits, benefits before death, uh, moral reasons, um, you know, those sorts of considerations. So I'm not committed to the, someone just wagering to, to get salvation. Um, and then the fourth reply is that even if there are very stringent dox doxastic requirements for salvation, I think the wagerer is putting themselves in a path to meet those requirements. So they put themselves in a position that makes it more likely that they will have faith and maybe even eventually come to belief. So those are sort of some thoughts on how you might use hope to at least help with the impossibility objection. So um, the conclusion is that if one takes Pascal's wager, then one either has faith that God exists or hopes that God exists. And um, I hope that this can help us answer this objection to Pascal's wager that says Pascal's wager is necessarily uh, demonstrates these really bad motives. So thank you. All right, thank you so much. Uh, and we have comments from uh, Anne whenever you are ready. All right. Awesome. Just want to reiterate what others have said. Thank you to Adam and Josh and Becca for organizing and to Charity and Laura for the great exchange and all the participants um, who jumped in with questions. And thanks so much to Liz um, for her paper, which is fun to read. Um, Liz's arguments in the paper are like her moves in basketball. Uh, they pack a punch. So uh, <laughs> I was very tempted to wear my Club Bala shirt. 
Um, there's going to be a lot of basketball referencing today. Um, and I would wager that you know why, given that I'm coming from Baylor. Okay. Um, more seriously, though, uh, in the paper, <clears throat> Liz is addressing what I think is one of the most serious normative objections to Pascal's wager, um, which is that the wager acts with morally bad motives in taking the wager. And of course, as an ethicist, I find this kind of objection like more compelling than some of the other ones that are maybe talked about more. So I really appreciated her giving attention to this objection. And I also think that the strategy here is novel and, and promising. Um, so let me just recap. Uh, the objector says that wagers act from selfish motives, like the desire to escape hell or get the rewards of heaven for themselves or something. Um, and Liz argues that people can take the wager in a way that demonstrates virtuous motives, because either the wager exemplifies the virtue of faith or they exemplify the virtue of hope in God. Um, so certain wagers are going to meet the conditions for having faith in God's existence. And faith is a virtue, so the wager acting from a faithful motive displays a virtuous motive rather than the morally bad or selfish one. Um, and other wagers are going to meet conditions for hope in God's existence. And hope is a virtue too, so the wager who acts from hope displays another sort of virtuous motive rather than a morally bad or selfish one. Uh, and most of the paper is dedicated to showing precisely how a wager could meet conditions for having faith or having hope. I think Liz manages to characterize faith in God both unambiguously and ecumenically um, with respect to entrenched disagreements about general faith, like whether faith entails belief and what sort of commitment it requires, which I think is very admirable. Um, so it's sufficient for faith in God that a person has a positive cognitive attitude and positive cognitive attitudes towards God's existence. The person's resilient to new counter evidence to God's existence regarding God's existence, and the person commits to God. Plausibly, this wager has um, the the wagerer has positive cognitive and cognitive attitudes towards God's existence, along with resilience in the face of counter evidence and a commitment to God, whether it's just doxastic or acceptance, um, living as if God exists, right? And if this is true, then straightforwardly, the wager is going to meet the sufficient conditions for having faith that God exists on the very like ecumenical um, picture of faith we got. And then the line of reasoning runs parallel in the case of hope, when we hear the cognitive attitude in question is permitted to be weaker. Um, and again, to just reiterate, orthodox theories of hope just require the hoper have a positive cognitive attitude toward the hope for outcome and a belief that the outcome is possible. Um, so a wager has probably more than what's needed for hope, but at the least, at the very least, many wagers will have what's needed for hope, even if they don't have what's needed for faith. Um, and if we reject the orthodox view of hope and we take some extra condition, probably uh, the wager is going to satisfy this extra condition too in virtue of like their commitment to God. Um, so I think that in these arguments, Liz articulates connections between this burgeoning contemporary literature on faith and hope and the literature on Pascal's wager, uh, which is by itself a worthy contribution to both discussions. So I, I enjoy that. Um, but let's recall the goal of the paper is to defend the wager against this normative objection that wagering is somehow morally defective. So what I'm gonna invite Liz to say more about is the connection between on the one hand, the attitudes of faith and hope, and on the other, the virtues of faith and hope. So in the paper, Liz says, Faith is a virtue, and so the person who wagers from faith can have virtuous motives. And this inference looks pretty straightforward. But I think if we dig a bit more into the conceptions of hope and faith as virtues, we're going to find a need to build a bridge between the virtues, faith and hope, and the attitudes of faith and hope on the contemporary conceptions. And it's going to be once this connection is established that we can securely say the wager is virtuously motivated, but not until then. Okay, so I'm going to run through a couple of like bridging premises that we might supply here. They're just like preliminary ideas um, offer that I'm offering to Liz uh, and then some worries about how well they would work. Okay, so imagine first that we say having the attitudes of faith and hope in God um, just is having the virtues of faith and hope because what makes faith and hope virtues is their objects. Right. What distinguishes the mere attitudes from the theological virtues is that the object is supposed to be God. Um, so if we use this sort of bridge premise, 
the only gap that remains is to say that the attitudes somehow have the sort of stability that are characteristic of virtues. Um, and I was just going to note that in more recent literature on virtues, it's become pretty standard to hold that virtues are cross situationally consistent and temporally stable. So those are the features that faith and hope are going to need to have, the attitudes are going to need to have, even if their object is God, in order to qualify as virtues in like the contemporary sense. Um, so someone who is like honest at work, but at home seems to lack honesty, doesn't have like the cross situational consistency uh, or doesn't meet that requirement on having the virtue of honesty, according to like Christian Miller's recent book, for instance. Um, so consider the following scenario to illustrate how this might work in the faith case. So Christina, um, my friend Christina meets the conditions for attitude of faith in Baylor men's basketball. Um, she believes that they're going to, or she has faith that they're going to be national champs. Uh, she believes she has faith on Saturday night that they're going to win the national championship on Monday. She's got a positive cognitive attitude, positive cognitive attitude towards their winning. Um, her faith is resilient to counter evidence. Gonzaga plays a great game on Saturday night and she continues to have faith that Baylor's going to win. Um, she's committed to cheering them on and she makes a wager on Baylor's winning. Does her faith that Baylor will win count as an instance of the virtue of faith? Okay, suppose that Christina acquires this faith in Baylor's team only once Baylor makes the Sweet 16. Um, Christina is a bandwagoner. <laughs> and I think in this case, her faith isn't sufficiently stable to count as a virtue. Uh, virtue theorists are gonna argue that actions that are done from stable traits are just more praiseworthy than actions that are that are right or virtuous in the moment, but not done from virtue. And even people who are non-Aristotelians, like Nomi Arpoli is gonna say this, she's gonna say like counterfactual stability is important for an actions having moral worth that you would have responded um, over a long period of time and across different kinds of situations. Okay. Um, for instance, if someone gives to charity only after a windfall from some investment, but not before, it doesn't seem like they have generosity even if their actions are generous, right? So we might worry too that Christina's faith, if Christina wagers, um, is too unstable to count as virtuous. All right, um, so another potential gap on this proposal would be that uh, virtues are supposed to reliably benefit their possessor and the, commu the possessor's community. But we can imagine um, faith, the attitude failing to do this. So now imagine Christina has faith in Baylor's team, but the team's winning will result in Gonzaga's program getting shut down and kids losing their scholarships. So it seems like it's bad for the NCAA in some respect, their community, or at least part of the community if uh, they lose. And also it's gonna promote Bayer, Baylor players like arrogance or something like that. So, so action from virtue is supposed to promote benefits, um, like the, the, the good of the individual and the common good, that's the way it sometimes put. Uh, and we might worry that Christina's faith actually doesn't um, aim to promote something like benefits to the community. Um, and you might think that this worry is avoided in the case of faith in God, but I don't think that we can make this inference so quickly because in the case of the wager, we're not allowed to assume God exists um, and is the sort of being that's offering an external reward or eternal reward, excuse me. That's precisely what's in question, right? So on the hypothesis that God exists, maybe faith and hope in God characteristically benefit their possessors and their possessors communities so they like meet that condition on being a virtue but on the hypothesis that god doesn't exist it seems possible that these attitudes won't benefit the possessor and their community and if so then they're going to fail to be virtues um they might even be vicious and in fact you know in uh, my paper how hope morally vindicates faith i discuss a few of the objections to to faith um, on the basis of worries that religious faith produces harms to others like bigotry. Um, okay, so maybe one, we want a bridging premise like, okay, so long as faith and um, hope have additional features like stability and benefiting the possessor and their community, then they're the same as the virtues of faith and hope. Um, this option seems like less appealing to me, like it seems like it would work, but it's less appealing because then the earlier arguments showing wagers meet sufficient conditions for faith and hope the attitudes, take us less of the way to the conclusion that the wager is well-motivated. So the bridge premise has to do a lot more work. 
Um, but other than that, I can't think of objections to it. Um, okay, the last, the last potential bridging premise might be something like um, the motives constitutive of virtues of hope and faith are the motives exhibited um, in a one-off way in the wager's action. And if this were true, then we could say the wager's motivation is pristine morally without going so far as to ascribe the virtues to her. Um, and the problem I foresee with this potential bridging premise is that um, motives that are constitutive of virtues are supposed to be acquired by a process involving free decision um, on like traditional Aristotelian views. Aristotle says they have to be like from deliberation. Aquinas says that they have to be what he calls consequent passions. Um, and so the worry is that the wager could fail to have motives that were actually produced by free decision. Um, her motives could be like the product of, uh, you know, instinct or indoctrination or coercion. And um, in that case, they would, you know, she would have meet the conditions for faith or hope, but not meet conditions on motives that are constitutive of virtue. Um, so uh, just to sum up, uh, I'm just suggesting that we need to construct some sort of premise or multiple premises to bridge the gap between the claim that the wager has an attitude like faith or hope and that the claim that the wager has virtuous motives. Um, so just some initial thoughts and really looking forward to hearing what Liz has to say. Thank you. Thanks, Anne. I really, I'm, I'm so excited Anne was my commenter because I think she just really fills in uh, gaps for me in this argument where like she knows a lot about motivation and about virtue ethics and those are like I'm not a virtue ethicist and um, so it's been really valuable we've actually had a little bit of an email exchange too and she's pointed me to a lot of really helpful literature so um, maybe I'll just say uh, first thanks so much Anne and then also I definitely want to add like a section or, or maybe a subsection where I just talk more about how this connects to contemporary accounts of virtues, which I need to learn more about. And I started learning about in preparation for this, but I still have a lot of reading to do. So um, I'll give a couple like potential things I might say in response, but I definitely, this is something I wanna kind of think more about and uh, definitely incorporate into my argument once I do, do my homework on the reading. So, um, okay. So I wanted to kind of maybe respond a little bit to each of Anne's three points just really briefly and then say like two more things. So I think I'll be less than five minutes probably. Um, so the first, I think potential problem was like the wager might not demonstrate virtues because the virtues are stable in a certain way. And it's not guaranteed that like faith or taking Pascal's wager would be. Um, but I guess my thought was like, I think it it maybe depends on how we want to exactly cash out the commitment component. But I do think there are plausible ways of cashing out this commitment comp component that will give us quite a bit of both situational and temporal stability. Um, that is kind of part of what, what I think when we say faith uh, is resilient in light of counter evidence, I think that's part of what we want to be getting at is this idea that there is some kind of stability, even in light of counter evidence um, across times and across situations. So I think part of maybe how I could respond to this is just maybe by being a little bit more clear about what I mean by this long term commitment or what it means by faith being stable in light of counter evidence. But I, I do think maybe here, like, kind of bolstering up that commitment component could help with the stability because I would I would like there to be uh, an element of stability there for sure. Um, so the second thought was about whether um, virtue sort of reliably, reliably produces, so virtue is supposed to reliably produce goods for individuals in their communities. And then the question is whether uh, the cases of taking Pascal's wager in a way that demonstrates faith would produce those goods. So this is this is something I think I just want to kind of learn more about like the literature on this and like what people say. Um, and I think kind of the big question is like, how do we measure value for yourself and, and your community? And like, kind of in the decision theory framework, it's often measured in terms of expected value, right? And the thought is that the expected value of believing in God is higher than not believing. And, uh, you know, I haven't answered a ton of objections to the wager, but if I had, that's kind of the thought that's kind of behind, uh, like that drives a lot of the versions of Pascal's wager. And so I guess I'm wondering like 
how is that value measured? Could expected value play that role? Um, and then, you know, you might want to, to, to get in the community component, we might want to think more about some moral versions of the wager. Maybe those could, could help with the community component. Um, but I'm interested in cases where, yeah, like maybe there are some minor bad effects. Maybe there are cases where being religious leads to bigotry, for example. But what if there's still some kind of net good? Like, would that count? Would that be sufficient for it being a virtue? Um, and I am interested too, and Anne kind of mentioned this, but this idea that, you know, even if like faith in a basketball team would lead to bad effects. And I think too, like the value of faith is so dependent on the object of faith, right? And so there are clearly cases of faith where it would just lead to terrible effects, right? But um, Anne hinted at this idea that maybe if we sort of hone in on faith in God, um, maybe some of, you know, some of these you know, the basketball case, it might be like, yeah, there could be some, some really bad effects. Uh, but like with faith in God, yeah, I, I don't know. I guess I think maybe some, you know, it can help to kind of focus really specifically on that case in particular. Um, and then the final thing Anne mentioned was that virtues are acquired by free decision and, and faith or taking Pascal's wager may not be. And I think I, I just want to kind of think more about this because, yeah, again, a lot of this uh, kind of virtue ethic stuff is new for me. But I do wonder if it's plausible that like in the cases I'm thinking of, the wager does make some kind of um, some kind of free decision because they're sort of they're weighing costs and benefits and they're going through potentially even something like a you know, decision theory calculation. And again, I, I'm saying they're focusing on this case where it would be so good if they committed to God and God existed, but it doesn't seem like a case where someone's just like brainwashed into believing they're being motivated by a certain outcome. And so I, I wonder if I could tell a story on which the wager does, does make a free decision, uh, at least in the cases that I'm interested in. That wouldn't mean that everyone with a religious faith always makes a free decision, but when you're kind of wagering on God, I think it's plausibly associated with free decisions. So um, I'm interested in thinking more about that. Um, and then two more quick thoughts. So I'm interested in the idea that taking Pascal's wager, it, like if taking Pascal's wager is a way of demonstrating faith or hope, I think that is actually kind of an interesting result in and of itself, even if faith isn't a virtue. So one thing I want to think more about is, uh, you know, whether faith, whether it's a virtue or not, it might still be associated with, um, you know, certain good goods it might still be a good thing to have faith. And maybe you could even have faith can acting from faith can be a good motivation, even if it's not explicitly meeting um, all the conditions for uh, being a virtuous person. So. I, I, I want to include a discussion of virtue in my argument, but I still think there could be something interesting there, even if I can't get that bridge principle quite right. Um, so I wanted to say that as well. And then the last thing I wanted to say is that um, I think it's possible that, especially in certain paradigm, you know, so if certain paradigm cases of faith, so if faith that God exists isn't a virtue, it's like, at what point do we revise our understanding of what it means to be a virtue rather than revising our understanding of what counts as faith? So I'm wondering if like, does all virtue really have to be by free decision? Like maybe there are cases where, you know, someone's just brought up with tons of evidence for God's existence and just has faith in God their whole life and never really makes that free decision. Like maybe that's a case where we should actually like modus tollens it and be like, well, maybe, maybe you just don't have to have that for it to be a virtue. So I'm interested in both those possibilities. One, whether my argument's interesting, even if I don't make claims about virtues. And then two, whether we might want to revise our account of what counts as a virtue rather than our account of, of faith or hope. Um, so all of that to say, I thought these were really great comments and lots of stuff I, I need to think more about. So again, thanks so much, Anne. I really appreciated it. Awesome. All right. So uh, Laura's at the plate and uh, Mike Ray's in the batter box. <laughs> I thought we were on basketball metaphors. I can, <laughs> I can only handle one sport. In it. I, anyway, you guys are beyond me. Um, this is a, thank you both Liz and Anne. I thought that was super illuminating. Um, this is a small question and it's about whether, it's about the role of virtue. I thought the worry with taking Pascal's wager from bad motives was at least first and foremost that God wouldn't like it. And so it just wouldn't work. Um, so, so 
why aren't you arguing or are you arguing um, that it's possible to take Pascal's wager from motives that God would like rather than from virtuous motives? Oh, yeah, sorry. I'm trying to like take notes. I guess this is recorded, so maybe I don't need to, but um, yeah. No, that's a great question. Um, and I think this sort of relates to maybe that fourth point I was mentioning, which is like, how interesting would this argument be even if I didn't make claims about virtues? And yeah, I feel like I'm gonna sound potentially naive because I'm still like learning like what, like about the motivations literature, like what is good motives, what is bad motives? And I do think that virtue ethics gives us an account of good motives, but maybe part of what's behind your question is, is that need to be the only account um, and couldn't God be pleased with motives even if they're not like the ones that contemporary virtue ethics tells us that are good. Um, so, so yeah, I'm, I'm very open to that move. Um, and I guess, yeah, I, I guess I intended that to be at least in part my response to Anne, but I, maybe there's a challenge there as well, which is maybe I should think more about what God would require and like less about contemporary virtue theory. And then maybe if I thought about that, there would be some gaps in my argument that would be revealed. Yeah, I think there is this like slight worry in the background that's like, gosh, I think theology is going to be really important. I mean, the kind of the kind of whatever you need to have salvation. I think the claim is that it's like taking Pascal's wager could really get you that. Um, or at least could get you closer to it. And that was kind of coming up at the end. Um, and I think, I think that is a sort of properly theological claim. It doesn't strike me as having much to do with, with the virtues. Um, hmm. But I think, I mean, necessarily, it might be that God only lets you know, God only saves virtuous people. But God, I hope not. <laughs> uh, so I mean, it, it strikes me that it, it matters a lot what you think works for salvation. That that's the kind of do you, is that the is that the key claim that you're saying the wagerer the key category that you're saying the wagerer falls into? I mean, s at least one of them. But I do want to be open to the idea that you could think like having a relationship with God during this lifetime would also be really valuable. Or um, like again, there's like moral <clears throat> considerations that I think one could wager from that have to do with like other people or their salvation or God or God's desires. You know, so I'm. I'm open to letting a thousand flowers bloom and having, you know, different kinds of motivations. But yeah, I mean, I do think in traditional statements of the wager, salvation is kind of the main thing that's focused on. Um, but I also think, you know, it's not necessarily that God only saves virtuous people, but I do think God, like God wants us to become virtuous people and, and move towards being virtuous. And maybe when we hone in on like faith and hope, I mean, I, I don't know, I'm open to the idea that faith is at least very connected to one of the things that is necessary for salvation. So maybe faith as a virtue uh, is closely tied to salvation, at least in some way. So um, yeah, I think there's also, yeah, like we wanna really focus on like faith and then maybe also hope as virtues rather than like, you know, having to have all the virtues. But yeah, I think it's interesting. I mean, there's almost like three different things here. There's like, uh, you know, fit contemporary accounts of faith and hope, like the ones I was talking about in the paper. Then there's like contemporary accounts of virtues and maybe some of those talk about faith and hope, but there's also like these general things like stability and free decision and whatever. And then there's like what the Bible says about salvation, you know, like there's almost these three camps that there's just a lot of moving parts. And so I, I do want to think more about how we might fit all these together or whether like maybe the contemporary accounts of virtue aren't as essential to what I'm what I'm trying to argue um but but yeah I'm you know I'm still thinking through the exact mechanics of everything so thanks yeah. <laughs> thanks Liz and Anne um I so I I want to ask about the um commitment component and I want to give you a kind of dilemma um so it seems to me that the commitment component will either be commitment to God or commitment to something like pursuing, uh, put, 
the pursuit of evidence for God's existence, like repeatedly putting yourself in a position to acquire evidence or something like that. Now, it seems you can't have commitment to God without belief, like to borrow Charity's dating site example, if, you know, if Sam is chatting with Sally uh, and there's 50% chance that Sally is a chat bot and 50% chance that she's real. Um, it, it just makes no sense to, for Sam to commit to Sally, right? Um, so it seems like the commit, you won't have, you just won't have commitment to God under the conditions of the wager. But if it's commitment to something like the pursuit of evidence, then I, I don't know how the resilience condition would get satisfied, right? I mean, like in some sense, you will tolerate counter evidence, like you'll keep pursuing, but it's not like, I, I mean, that didn't seem to be the sort of resilience you had in mind, right? Otherwise, we're always resilient to counter evidence in some sense, right? Like uh, I get counter evidence for any one of my beliefs, but I forge ahead and continue to live, you know, um, or maybe I'd continue to inquire uh, if I'm interested. But like, it seems like the kind of resilience you have in mind is maintaining your credence level or maintaining your belief or something like that. But if all you're committed to is the pursuit of evidence or the pursuit of truth or something, it doesn't really make sense necessarily to be resilient to counter evidence in that sense, right? And so, so I guess it's looking like either you lack the commitment component entirely or you lack the resilience component, um, depending on what you say commitment amounts to uh, under wager conditions. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great point. I think there's actually a way I could make either bullet more biteable. <laughs> so I want to say a little bit about each. Uh, maybe I'll start with the, the second one. So like the thought is if you're commitment, committing to pursuing evidence and then like, like how does that fit with this idea that you're trying to pursue truth? Um, is that person really wagering? And I think one thing that is really helpful to think about here. So Laura Bouchak has a paper that's forthcoming called A Faithful Response to Disagreement. And she has this really interesting model that I think is really cool, which is like, if we're interested in certain epistemic benefits, including truth, and in fact, you can actually do this in terms of someone that's just interested in truth, there's actually really important benefits of like continuing in certain um, like especially like these central life commitments, like moral beliefs, political beliefs, religious beliefs. Um, there's these like really important epistemic benefits that we can get. And, and in her, her model, you continue to like believe, you know, that eating meat is wrong or that God exists or that this political, this form of government is great. Um, but your credence moves around as you get counter evidence or whatever. And she really convincingly argues that this is actually one way um, to like, get really important epistemic benefits, both individually, but also as a group. There's some really interesting evidence that group disagreement helps the group reach the truth in the long run in a way that like everyone just like change, you know, conciliating all the time doesn't. So I think there's actually really interesting evidence that uh, resilience to counter evidence can lead to certain epistemic benefits, especially if you could like, so if you continue in the face of counter evidence and then the thing you're committing to turns out to be true, there's like a ton of really interesting epistemic benefits that you can get. Um, so maybe I'll just say like, look at her paper, but there's, I think there's an argument that to be made there. Maybe I misunderstood that horn, but um, I think that's potentially relevant. Um, for the first horn, which is like commitment to God, I guess I'm wondering like, what about something like a commitment to pursuing a relationship with God? Um, I, how like, would that fall under what you're saying? And I think I would just reject this idea that you can't have a commitment to God without belief. I mean, I agree with you and Charity that the chatbot cases are kind of ridiculous and silly, but I think like someone can, I mean, even in my own life, I've been in places where I'm like, do I really believe that God exists right now? But I think I like, I can, I can continue to pursue God and have that relationship with God and consider that possibility. Like if God exists, like this is a really great thing to be committed to. And this is worth kind of betting my life on this. And so I, I think you can have a, a genuine relationship with God without belief. Um, but maybe we just disagree there. And I mean, we agree that I think those cases 
the chatbot cases are a little silly. So maybe it'd be nice if we had some better cases uh, for that. But but yeah, I think I would just disagree with that. Uh, Charity? Thanks so much, Liz. Um, I don't know that much about Pascal's wager, so uh, I could be misunderstanding the objection, but the way I understand it, it seems like you you will have replied to it, but there seems to be a much easier way to reply to it that doesn't involve faith or hope or a virtue or commitment or resilience to counter evidence, which would seem a little bit better because the the idea that I have of the wager is that like the standpoint of the person taking it is probably not going to be the mindset of someone who's going to say, I'm going to both, you know, act a certain way and commit. And also I'm going to be resilient to all counter evidence. I mean, that, that just, yes, you're right that like there's a plausible or a possible agent who might do that, but it seems really implausible that they would be resilient to counter evidence. But anyways, but here's the easy way. So if the objection is that you take the wager out of bad motives where the bad motives are being motivated by fear of hell or a selfish desire to get the rewards of heaven. I mean, one thing note for that to be your motive, we would need to say a little bit more about what God you're wagering on. And it would need to be a God that you think is going to send people to hell or send people to heaven. So why not wager on a God that you think um, uh, you don't have good reason to think he exists, but you, but you think this about him. You think that he would be your greatest good and that you would flourish if you were in relationship with him. Stop, <laughs> you know, like that's yeah. all you have to have is basically the positive cognitive attitude. Thinking God's existence would be a good thing. Um, thinking it would be a good thing for you, which yes, you could call that a selfish motivation, but I think that's a motivation God would be pleased with. Um, and that's all, that seems to be all you, all you need. So why isn't that enough to reply to the objection? Yeah, no, that's great. I do think in that case, you would probably need, um, like what I called a weekly positive cog cognitive attitude, because you wouldn't want to say like, it's impossible for that kind of God to exist. But, um, I think in like, you're actually kind of describing sort of what I think it might look like in the case of hope, um, where you are really just kind of meeting these two conditions. So, um, so yeah, I do think like there is a lot of robust maybe things involved in the definition of faith. Um, and I'm really open to this idea that someone could wager in the way you're describing in, in a hopeful way. So I, I think I basically agree with you. Um, and maybe, I mean, I guess like two things to say, like one is like, maybe I am going a little bit beyond just replying to this objection in the paper. And maybe I need to, uh, frame it slightly differently where I say like this replies to the objection and uh, I think and I want it to be more than just an existential claim like some possible agent does this but you know I think like you know how do I set this up in a way that's not everyone does it but not just one person you know so that that is tricky but I do think it's it's going to be a relatively natural maybe way of taking it once you're once you kind of have the mindset that I'm describing like in that section too so yeah, I need to think more about what the exact claim is there. So I agree with that. Um, but I think you're you're right that like it's not that hard to respond to this maybe because because I do think yeah like look like you just think God is is your greatest good and you don't have like it can be like self interested even if it's not like selfish it's not like you're like ignoring other people's preferences you're just saying like it would be such a good thing to be like connected to the ultimate source of goodness you know so. So yeah, I think I basically just agree. Um, but I will say too, one thing you said is like, you don't think the wager would be resilient to counter evidence, but I guess I don't see why, because I think they're motivated, like literally all it takes is this possibility to motivate them. And maybe they have like a 0.5 credence and then their credence goes down to 0.4, but it seems like they would still be motivated to pursue God. So I, I would think they would be resilient to counter evidence just in virtue of the fact that what's motivating them is primarily non-epistemic reasons. So I do think they would be resilient to counter evidence, but I think I also agree with you that you could probably reply to the objection and like on a much thinner account of, <laughs> of what's required. So. Yeah, so just one quick follow up. Yeah. And this was something that I was sort of going back and forth throughout because it seemed like the way you were setting it up was not something empirical, like people in fact, are motivated yeah. to take the wager out of these bad reasons 
but you 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 know in the abstract you wanted to say something stronger like many who take the wager have genuine faith but that would be an empirical question um yeah, that's true if all you want to argue is that it is possible for someone to take the wager and have faith then i think um we could agree but what i was trying to say is that if the objection to the wager is that people would have have to have bad motives then it seems a lot easier to show no they don't have to have bad motives they could have good motives and here's a really simple easy way they could have a good motive and um and then what i was trying to say about faith is that i think just in, as a matter of fact people would probably not be resilient um but maybe we because it looks irrational to me to take the wager so maybe we just disagree about what in fact people who take the wager would look like as they move forward in life and get counter evidence but that's you know that's not something we'll settle a priori <laughs> Yeah, I, okay, I think I'm slightly confused about the last thing. Because you think it's irrational to take the wager so then they wouldn't be resilient to counter evidence? Or? I'm thinking it's possible for someone to irrationally take the wager and be resilient to counter evidence, but I'm thinking mm -hmm. most people are more rational than that. And if they get a lot of counter evidence, they'll probably give up. But that's, a, you know, that's not something really worth arguing about, I guess. Yeah, yeah, I see what you're saying. Okay, sorry, I was just kind of confused about what you were saying. Yeah, no, I think. I think you're right. Like, I want to say something about once you have this kind of mindset I'm describing, and it is actually a lot of like what you were saying, where you're like, God is my greatest good. And like, that is worth betting my life on. Once you have that mindset, um, I think you plausibly demonstrate a kind of faith. But I don't necessarily want to make a claim that like, I want to avoid like the versions of that that sound a lot like empirical claims. It's more like a connection between this kind of mindset and then like what it means to have faith so so maybe i just stated it in a misleading way i'm not trying to say like people who are in fact wagering <laughs> in the actual world look let's like go do a brain scan like oh they have faith. like that's not what i'm trying to say i'm trying to like i think what i'm trying to do is bring a connection between like two literatures that i think are actually kind of interesting and it, it kind of connects like two of my research programs too because i'm like actually, this is really interesting, like faith's resilience in light of counter evidence, you can actually cash that out in terms of like, look how good it would be if God existed and I committed to him, which starts to start looking like Pascal's wager. So part of it is also just me realizing like, hey, a lot of this is about the long-term rationality of religious commitment in a really interesting way. But I think you've given me a lot of things to think about in terms of like framing and maybe making some claims stronger and some claims weaker. So anyway, I appreciate it. <laughs> Well, there's at least one more person in the queue who wants to, um, it's Anthony Rowden. Yeah, thanks Liz for your talk. Um, I, hey. Hey, uh, I wondered, um, just talking about virtues and stuff like that and, and some of the, you know, taking Pascal's wager for um, probably wrong reasons. I was wondering how your paper would interact with maybe some skepticism about understanding what God's, what motives God wants for, um, taking the wager or if there's some sort of like, uh, yeah, like expressing some kind of skepticism about, you know, discerning why, what God's motives would be for wanting us to take the wager or whether they're good or bad or that, that kind of thought, if you have any ideas there. Mm. So maybe like, is this like kind of like a skeptical theist thing where it's like, well, we don't know what God would want. Is that kind of what you had in mind or? Yeah, 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 a little bit like that. Mm. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, I think this also relates to like some of Laura's comments about like there being a lot of kind of theological questions that are intertwined with a lot of things that I'm saying. So I do think I'm helping myself at least to some assumptions about what motives God would want. And I want to think more about to what extent is that, how, how connected is that to like contemporary virtue ethics? Um, so, so yeah, I think, I, but I am assuming that we're not totally in the dark about that. And I would like to think that that's consistent with some maybe like weaker versions of skeptical theism, but I have worries about um, really strong versions of skeptical theism that say like we can know almost nothing about God, God's motives. Um, you know, I know Mike who's here has like written about this too. So I don't know if he uh, wants to add anything. So I guess like my stance is like, I think we at least have some access to what God would want and some access to like the motives that God would want us to have, even if we don't have like full and complete knowledge there, but there is there is some theological stuff that comes along with that and maybe even 
um, like looking at like scripture and what's revealed there. But also I think part of it is revealed uh, through like natural, uh, you know, beliefs that God gives us about morality, like some kind of uh, built into our minds. So, so yeah, I'm not, I, I want to say like, we might not have full knowledge, but I also, uh, I'm skeptical of the intense skeptic, skeptical views too. <laughs> All right. Um, I just wanted to scan to see, if, did anybody uh, want to get in the queue who did not um, did not put themselves in yet? This kind of last call. Okay, well, I'll go ahead and maybe put one in then. Um, so, I'm resonating a bit with Anne's instincts to go directly to the literature, historical and contemporary on faith and hope, because I, I, and yet at the same time, I wanna say, yeah, I mean, there's common uses of faith and hope along which it seems like you could correctly describe the wagerer or a wagerer as having faith or hope in those senses and these have a foundation in the respective literatures, but I wonder if we smuggle a positive uh, affect about the conclusion in illicitly by sort of assuming that faith and hope in the sense at issue have some sort of substantive relationship with the faith and hope that we talk about biblically and that Aquinas talks about and uh, et cetera. And, um, partly, I'm a little leery of just how weak the conditions are for hope there, the two condition step, you know, so S has a positive cognitive attitude toward P, uh, and S has a weak positive cognitive attitude toward P, and I'm, I'm thinking a little bit like, all right, how, how might I otherwise describe someone who's some potential persons who satisfy these conditions, you know, that's less buoyant and cheerful and as, as describing them as hopeful, like, um, wouldn't somebody who is motivated by wishful thinking have a positive cognitive attitude um, and have at least a weak cognitive attitude, right? Or suppose you have someone who's has a hard time holding on and is in a sort of despair. So they have a positive attitude toward it being true and maybe they're not down to 0 0.01 or something like that. Uh, maybe they're like at 0 0.3, but they're, they're sort of the, the affective surround for this kind of attitude is just sort of, um, they're a little bit crushed by the fact that they're not over 0.5, even though in a sense they have a positive cognitive attitude and they have the, the cognitive attitude. So I'm having a bit of a so what reaction of like, why should I take the fact that someone can satisfy these two conditions that we're associating with hope? Why is it what significance should I build in that? So I wonder if you could talk to that a little bit. Yeah, no, that's great. I mean, I think a lot of that is kind of getting at some of the heart of, of Anne's worry, which is something I, I definitely want to think more about and hopefully incorporate into the paper. Um, but I guess a couple things. So like, I do think this is part of the reason why, like you've been articulating basically the reason why people want to add these extra conditions to hope and not just say it's these two things. And I went over it super quickly, but I do think it's plausible that on a lot of these accounts, whatever that extra condition is, especially on like the distinguishing hope from despair, um, that extra condition is, sorry, plausibly met uh, in the case that I'm interested in. So I do think um, the person with that wagers, but has, you know, the very low credence that God exists, but still has a positive cognitive attitude. Uh, plausibly, there's other things that are true of them, like the commitment condition and stuff. And so I do think those can help at least, um, you know, in distinguishing that case from the despair case and stuff. Um, I did want to say something about wishful thinking, though, because I think that's a really interesting um, case. So when you hear the word wishful thinking, I think a lot of philosophers just say like bad, like, like, ugh, like, no, wishful thinking, like, that's not a good thing to do, right? But when you think about what is wishful thinking, well, at least when you apply it to belief, it's like believing something, believing that P because you take P to be good or because you want P to be true. Um, and I do think wishful thinking, at least in most cases of belief, is probably a bad thing. But it's really interesting to actually think about like wishful faith or like wishful hope because it's actually a lot less obvious that like 
hoping that P because you want P to be true or you take P to be a good thing or like even having faith that P because you want P to be true or take P to be a good thing. Um, it's not at all obvious that that's actually like at least inherently a bad thing. Um, and I think this is actually a really interesting thing that's like different about faith and hope than belief um, because faith and hope are by definition, like more intertwined with our desires than belief is, but also have a weaker epistemic component. Um, and so I guess, yeah, like I get the cringe at wishful thinking reaction, but I also think we need to be careful when we're thinking about faith and hope because it's actually not as obvious that something like wishful thinking um, would automatically be irrational in those cases. I hope that it will, won't rain tomorrow because I don't want it to rain tomorrow. You know, it's like, that's kind of wishful thinking, but because hope has so, so much of a weaker like epistemic component, um, that's not as obviously irrational. So, um, so I think that that's, it's kind of interesting to think about like how wishful thinking uh, maybe changes when we're thinking about it outside of the context of belief. Um, there's probably more to be said to your comment. And well, I think, there, there's yeah. so much more to talk about yeah. I also want to honor our commitments to end on time because one last time to thank our presenters and our commentators, if we could. Um, that doesn't feel as satisfying on Zoom, never does. Oh, well, but it was a uh, wonderful sessions. Thank you so much. And thank everyone who joined us. Um, and I hope you're continuing to have a good conference. Thanks, Adam. Thanks again, Adam. Thank you so much, everyone. This was really fun. Awesome. <laughs> Thanks, Adam.